Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC guy. Several months ago, I showed you how you could install a Soundtracks plug and play decoder in this locomotive right here. And I also showed you how to install a mobile decoder in a B unit. I believe it was an NCE decoder. What I want to show you today is how you can do a similar thing with a Soundtracks mobile decoder, put it in this B unit, so it's going to be much, much more compatible operating with the Soundtracks decoder in the lead unit. And you can do this with any AB set or with any two locomotives that you operate in a consist where you want to have a sound unit in the lead unit and a mobile only decoder in the B unit. So let's go ahead and get started with that. Hit that little red uh, subscribe button, and when the little bell comes up, click on it and click all. Okay, before we get started with the actual installation of the decoder in the locomotive, there are a couple of things that I want to point out to you. First of all, Soundtrax has two different ranges of the DCC mobile decoders. They have first what they call their MC1. And the MC1 decoders are smaller. They're sized primarily for in-scale locomotives. They'll, they'll fit in a lot of tight spaces. But they have some limited features because in reading through their material, it appears that they do not support CVs 5 and 6, which would allow you to have three-step speed curves. These also, I believe, have more functions, more lighting functions than the MC1s. And these are sized somewhat larger. So this one right here is their rectangular board version, and it is the MC2H104AT. So that is the Atlas or Atherin version, and these will fit in a lot of modern diesel locomotives. The others in, in the MC2 series are different size formats for HO scale locomotives. And all of these, I believe, are rated at one amp. So pretty good power output. They have about 100 milliamps per function output. So fairly good there. And they can be operated, I believe it is, on up to 22 volts on the track. So most of your layouts are going to be completely compatible with these. And the great thing is they're essentially a drop-in replacement for the circuit board that comes in the locomotive from Walther's. And these were made by Lifelike, oh, around uh, the year 2000, right after 2000 was when they first introduced these. And they're a, a slightly lower cost version than the Proto 2000. And then Walther's purchased Lifelike and continues to make these F3 locomotives, the Proto 1000 series. So you can still get these. I imagine that they've modified the circuit board somewhat, but I think it's probably still in this type of circuit board. Now, obviously there's a lot of these that were made by Lifelike that have this type of board that you can pick up at train shows and off of eBay and places like that. But these are a very fairly easy replacement type of operation, as I'll show you in a minute. Now, the other thing that I'm going to show you is how you can add a Soundtrax current keeper or other type of stay alive device to these circuit boards because these do not have any kind of direct uh, solder pads or sockets where you can plug in a current keeper or other keep alive or stay alive. So I will show you a diagram supplied by Soundtrax that shows you how to attach a current keeper or other stay alive device to this circuit board. Now another thing that I'm going to show you in a future video, and I'm not going to have time to do it this time, this is the new KA-N1 Keep Alive from TCS. So as you can see, these things are tiny. It's sitting there on my little fingernail, and uh, so it's smaller than my little fingernail. So that gives you an idea of just how small these are. Now, I haven't tried these out yet. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I'm going to try this in a small switcher locomotive that I just have a uh, DC only or DC mobile decoder in, because I don't think that these have enough voltage to drive a sound decoder. I think they just have enough voltage to keep a motor going for one to two seconds. But it, at least that's what TCS says in the uh, in their instructions that come with these keep alive. So we'll be trying that out in a future video, probably the next one after this one. So 
The first thing we're going to do then is we need to start taking the board out of this and install this one. So let me get rid of some of this clutter here and we'll get started with that process. Well, true to form, I got started on doing the video, forgot to hit the record button, so I'm at this point where I've already got most of the work done up front. So let me go over what I've done as opposed to putting it all back together again and doing it one more time. Basically, this is the board that comes in the locomotive and it's held in place by a couple of Phillips head screws. So all you have to do is back those two Phillips head screws out and that will release the board from its position in the uh, locomotive. Then there are these little black caps and I'm sure you've seen these on each one of these tabs that hold the various wires in place. So what we have here, there's the motor um, minus and motor plus wire. And by the way, these are correct. The red is motor positive, black motor negative. So on the board, this is motor positive, motor negative, and it was attached to the red and the black wires respectively. So once you pull off all these tabs, it just releases all of these wires that you can work with then. Now the next thing we're going to do is we want to install this board right here in place. Now, one thing to be aware of, if you look right here, and I'll try to hold it up, but I doubt you can see the lettering, it has a BL and a HL right here. HL means headlight, BL means backup light. So this is the rear of the unit. So it needs to go in this way. And, that, um, and, and that's important to have that set up because you don't want your headlight and your reverse light uh, reversed. Now, in this particular case, it really doesn't matter because I'm not going to be using any lights. The B unit did not have one. But if you were using it with an A unit or something that had a lights, such as a Jeep or something of that nature, you would attach your headlight and your rear light here and here accordingly. So all we're going to be doing today is attaching the motor leads, attaching the power pickups from this rear truck, attaching power pickups from the front truck, and that's it. So let's get started with doing that. Now the way I'm going to hold this in place is I'm going to make up a set of pads using this double stick foam tape. So this is standard 3M double stick foam tape. I think I probably picked this up at Staples or someplace like that that sells office supplies. You might be able to get this at your local uh, big box store. Places like that sell all kinds of this stuff. So what I'm going to do is attach it to the bottom of the board and that's going to hold it in place quite well. And I'm going to have to build up a pad right here on the top of the motor and that's how I'm going to mount this. Instead of building up a big thick pad of foam in order to support the, uh, the decoder above the frame, I decided to just take a piece of plastic tubing. Now this is a piece of plastic. It's a rectangle tubing. It is number 90632 and uh, I just happen to have a package of it. So I'm just going to use a piece that I cut off and I'm going to mount that right here on the top of the motor and then I'll mount the decoder on top of that. So let's take a look at how that's going to work. Okay, so here you can see I've got the piece of plastic uh, tubing mounted in the uh, spot on top of the motor. Now you have to do this because you don't want any of these uh, shorting out, any of these contacts shorting out on the frame which they are likely to do because you've got motor, you've got the mounts, the mounting screw spots here. So you could have a contact there and then there's contacts on each side. So you just have to be very careful to make sure that this sucker is mounted high enough so it's not touching the frame anywhere. Okay, so after that, I'm going to take, cut another piece of my foam tape, just long enough to fit on here. And we'll slap it down in place. Okay. And pull off the little protective layer. There we go. And then make sure you got it correct so it's HL is forward. And let me get these wires out of the way. That one. And just place that down on the tape. And this tape 
works miracles. 3M really developed a good product with this. I've had this stuff last for over 20 years and had to really pull and cut in order to get a, a, a device that I had mounted using it uh, free. So it's going to hold and it's not going to damage your decoder. There. There. Okay, so at this point we've got the decoder mounted. Now we can go ahead and make the contacts. Now I don't like using these little guys, so I'm going to solder them in place on these tabs. So I'm going to prepare these by tinning them. Tin each tab that I'm going to be using very quickly. And let's see, get my motor wires ready. And I need to trim this one just short enough to where it's going to fit. And I've got a uh, pair of wire strippers here to strip the end. And we'll pretend that end as well. There we go. Okay, black is going to be our motor negative. Okay. So black is going to go to the motor negative. And we'll bring red over to motor positive. And of course that's not going to be long enough, so I'm going to have to add something to that. Fortunately, we've got some red left over. Okay, let's do all the other wires first. Okay, let me turn this around. And one more. Okay, that one's done. Now I'm going to take this little piece here that was left over from an earlier cut and we'll pre tin it. Do a splice here. And then I've got a piece of heat shrink tubing to fit over that. And then because this is um, a polyolefin material, you can just gently stroke it with your soldering iron and it's going to shrink. And that's going to protect it. And you can get this heat shrink tubing off of, um, off of eBay, Amazon, all kinds of places like that. Other hobby suppliers sell it. So just get a good assortment. And I've talked about the heat shrink tubing in previous videos that I did on various tools that I use for DCC installs. Okay, so I'm going to bring this, we're just going to run this underneath of the board like that. So it's out of the way. Bring it around and then I'm going to cut it right about here and we'll get it ready to be soldered. Okay. And now I'm going to get this to where I can see what I'm doing. And we'll solder that in place. Okay. Now, you would do the same thing uh, for your LED, for whatever you're using for your headlight here. You've got your voltage plus here for the blue wire, and your HL is your uh, function wire to go to the wire to your headlight. So make sure that you're aware of the polarity there. So now we're going to take a look at that diagram from Soundtracks on how to connect a current keeper 
or any other stay alive uh, to the board. So let's take a look at that diagram because I'm not going to install one here in this locomotive. I've never found these to actually need any further assistance like that. But I want you to see, just in case you have a locomotive, you know, if you've got a real small uh, Atlas switcher, say, or something like that, that you want to install a, a Keep Alive in, then, you know, this is how you would do it. They do have uh, diagrams like the one I'm going to show you on how to uh, attach these devices to various types of their mobile-only decoders. So all you have to do is contact Norman or George at uh, tech support at Soundtracks, and they'll be happy to send you a, uh, a copy of the uh, figure. So let's take a quick look at that, and you can see then that you basically just attach the blue wire to your voltage plus wire con uh, contact, and then the black wire goes to that uh, diode right there. You can see that where the black wire is attached. And there's plenty of room to do soldering in there. You can easily get your soldering iron in and make those contacts. So if you want to do a current keeper, that's how you go about adding it to this particular board. And like I said, contact tech support at Soundtracks if you purchase one of the other types of MC1 or MC2 boards and you want to add a keep alive. Okay, so at this point then, We've got power being supplied to the board from the left and right rails, and we've got the motor contacts made. So I'm going to crank up a DCC system, and we'll give this a test drive. Okay, here we are over on my module, and uh, we'll give this a quick test drive. I've left it set to the basic uh, to the basic settings. I haven't even changed the address, so it's going to work off of address three. So let's give it a test drive. And this one hasn't run in a while. I uh, haven't uh, had this out on the layout, although I have lubricated it. So it should run okay. So you can see it's a fairly quiet runner, very efficient motor. I've never had any problems with these. So they work great in combination with any other type of locomotive on your modern railroad. But with this particular Soundtracks decoder combined with a locomotive operating with a Soundtracks um, Economy or Tsunami uh, decoder, you're going to get even better performance because all of the uh, speed settings, the hyperdrive settings, all of that are essentially the same. Now one thing I did mention up front was that there is one small thing that you have to be aware of. These decoders are an earlier version of the Soundtracks design and they have uh, the track voltage setting hardwired into the programming. So it's assumed that track voltage is approximately 15 volts. Now with the Economy and the Tsunami decoders, you can change that. And it's uh, done in CV215. Uh, and the number that you, uh, the default is 150, which is 15 volts. So if you've got track voltage of 14 volts, you would change CV215 to a value of 140, and that would give it 14 volts. So whatever you've got your track voltage operating at, you need to um, you need to be aware of that. And if you're using your economy or your tsunamis alone, then you would want to uh, to change that CV215 to reflect the actual voltage. However, if you're going to be using one of these decoders, one of these MC1s or MC2s, they are going to be set at 15 volts. Uh, and you can't change that. So whatever uh, locomotive that you operate with it, if it's an economy or a tsunami, you need to change CV215 to a value of 150 so that they're both assuming the same track voltage. And that affects how the locomotive responds and back EMF and the hyperdrive, all of that kind of uh, fancy stuff is in those decoders, so you need to make that adjustment. Other than that, these things run very, very well. Well, that's a wrap for today's video. Hopefully that'll get you started with installing the Soundtracks mobile-only decoders in some of your locomotives in your fleet. You know, they're very inexpensive. They're in the range of $25 to $35 each, depending on the format that you choose. And that way you'll be able to convert a lot more of your locomotives to DCC-compatible versions 
fairly quickly or at least uh, less expensively than it would cost you if you were using sound decoders. Because to be honest with you, once you've got one sound locomotive in the lead, you don't always need a second one in the consist. It can get annoying to be honest with you when you got several of these droning on. So have a great week, have a great weekend, and we'll see you here in a couple of weeks with another video from the DCC Guide. Bye now.